Hey guys, so thank you first off for 10,000 subscribers. That's nuts. Yeah, I was not expecting this amount of subscribers by episode two. And also thank you to Matthew Wilson, our first Patreon member. Yeah, we kind of shadow dropped uh, Patreon. <laughs> yeah, the content and the class here is all free. This is just a way for you guys to toss us some support to help us keep running the channel. Welcome to our bonus episode. We got one more slightly tedious thing to explain to you guys. And that is called type safety. This is something that we did have originally in episode two, but we cut it for time. And in fact, you can see the remnants of it in our code here. It's the stuff that looks like you have code and then you just are trying to prove that you're smarter than everybody. Yeah, yeah that's a good <laughs> with, way of putting with that. With colons and arrows. And <laughs> does this even mean anything? A float to a float? What are we doing here? Type safety is one of those things that's going to really save your hide as your game gets more complicated and grows in scope. So there's two camps of programming languages. There are statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages. You'll also hear this called strongly typed or weakly typed languages. So Godot, or more specifically GD script, is using dynamic typing. It's it's weak, it's wimpy. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have any rules. It's anarchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would almost call it more like the assuming type. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's just gonna assume the types. Whereas yeah. like a strongly typed or statically typed language, it's gonna make you tell it, no, the type is this. Yeah. And there's no better evidence that dynamically typed languages are not as great as the fact that most dynamic type languages now offer a way to add types to them. It almost seems like Godot is moving towards being a statically typed language. It definitely feels that way because there's the safety benefits and then there's even performance benefits that can come out. Even of in their templates, they well. use like like statically typed language, like the float, arrow, float kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Now it might sound like we're getting into nitpicky territory and like to a degree it is, but it really is for your benefit down the road of reducing the amount of bugs that you would run into, especially once your lines of code get into the hundreds and even and thousands of lines. So type safety is the practice of adding more information to your code to make sure the computer knows exactly what you're asking for. So you could see it at like something like var speed. We have a colon and then float. That colon float is, is an example of it. And we're saying we want not just a number like an integer or a float or the word of the number in a string. We want a float, a number with a decimal point. But if we were to remove this, we can do heinous things. <laughs> down under the ready function, we could change the data type of the speed to anything else and the game would still run. So we could go down here and assign speed equals a string of five, like, like a, a word, it's not even a number. And the engine doesn't give me any warnings. It's just like, you're good. And you'll see if I actually do try to run this, the game basically breaks instantly. So with type safety, the way we had it, we could add back in the data type of a colon float telling the computer that when we are getting speed, we're asking for a float. And immediately you can see a red bar comes up over the speed stream because it's like, yo, we only do floats around here. Yeah, and if you were to try to play right now, it's not gonna let you because with type safety, you have to resolve these issues before you can like run or build your project. Boom, crashed. That's a small example of how things can go awry, but with a dynamically typed language or a weak type language, you could have things that actually do let your game run that don't break the game until you run across it in game. Think of it like if you were to go mine a stone in a game and there's something that you can acquire from that stone that has that weakly typed piece of data in it that once you pick it up, it immediately breaks the game because the computer got the wrong information it assumed. So moving forward, we are gonna set Godot up to be a more statically typed language. And luckily we have settings for that in the project settings. We're going to start by turning on advanced settings and then just use your filter settings bar there and type GD script. And that'll take us right to this GD script section. There's a lot of options in here. You can really customize the behavior. The only one we really care about right now is untyped declaration. And we're going to set that to error. Hardcore. That should be good. And now if we were to remove colon float from line four. Boom. Immediate error. Yeah, it's mad at us. It's like, hey, you have to tell me what type this is going to be. So. And it will actually tell you that at the bottom as well in like human language, which I think is really cool. So variable speed has no static type. It needs to add that data type to it. Now, in cases like variables, it can get really tedious to have to write colon float and then immediately have a float on the right hand side. So GD script does offer us a mechanism to kind of like shorthand this. So instead of having to say colon float equals, we can just do colon equal, kind of smush those two things together. This is a feature called type inference and a lot of more modern statically typed or strongly typed languages now support this sort of thing where, hey, if we can figure out what's on the right hand side from what we see, then we can automatically say that this is of that type. 
We don't have to do this with constants because constants can only be set to a literal value. So it's really easy for the computer to figure out what type the value is. And because constants can never change, there's no risk of changing it to a value it's not supposed to hold. Real quick, I'm also going to delete the speed equals five because we're not doing that. That was just for that first example. Mm -hmm. So line 10 is mad at us right now because the ready function doesn't return anything. And so therefore, we actually have to tell it to return void. And void is essentially the absence of a type, the absence of anything. It is nothingness, as Nick has told me, which frustrated me to the nth degree because I said, so you mean zero? And he said, no. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's not zero, it's nothing. And I said, zero is nothing. And then we went in this circle for about the next two hours, which <laughs> led me to not understanding it completely until I put it into practice and I could explain as a noob what it kind of means. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So this arrow is saying what type of thing we get out of this function. But if you might notice, these functions functions are just running the instructions it's told to do, which is a simple print function to the console. It doesn't get a value out of it. It's just returning void. Now, this would change to something like in the above function, get boost and speed. We're using the boost multiplier. This is setting the parameter. This is a parameter. Yep. Declaring it. And we want that parameter to be a number, a float. And so we're going to be using this in the function return speed times boost multiplier. So what do we get out of this? Not void we get a float. These arrows and the parameters and the colon, I know it looks super crazy, but that's all it's saying is, hey, what do you expect out of this is gonna get a float, which might sound redundant, but in the long run, it's gonna save your booty. It, by the way, it's okay if void doesn't totally make sense to you right now. It, it took a second to click for me. So one more thing, dynamically typed languages have to kind of allow pretty much everything. They run on assumptions, but one area this can really hurt you is when you try to use a property or a function that doesn't actually exist where you expect it to be. In a dynamically typed language, which doesn't have the information to know that. So a great example of how this might bite you right in the bum is if we on line 26 forgot the D and normalized, with the settings we have on right now, we're gonna get told this function doesn't exist. There's no function called normalize. Interesting, even though it turns it turns blue. It turns blue because the syntax is a function call, right? Mm -hmm. as, as in, we have the parentheses after it. Like I could say anything. Yeah. Like I could have written like, uh, bum. <laughs> yes, exactly. So let's quickly go back to project settings and turn off untyped declarations to let us get away with things that shouldn't. Now on line 25, let's remove the colon from input dir because right now it's inferring the type. So it knows the input dir is going to be a vector too. Vectors all have a function called normalized on them, but it can be really easy sometimes to use the wrong function name or misremember something. So let's say, for example, on the next line down, we were going to do input dir dot normalized. And you can see what the function name should be here. But what if we forgot the D? Notice how right now it's totally happy letting us do this because it doesn't actually know what input dir is. It doesn't know what type it is. And it's fine not knowing what type it is. But the moment we added a colon back to that equal sign, now it knows it's a vector two. And it knows that vector two doesn't have a normalized function. It has a normalized function. So if we put the D back in there, it's happy as a clam. And that's type safety, which is cool, right? <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this episode. Next episode will be something cooler. <laughs> we're going to delete this, though. Just letting you guys know, we're resetting this back to what it was.